a special friend you are. It's a beautiful day in the neighborhood, a beautiful day for a neighbor. Won't you be mine? Won't you be mine? It's a neighborly day in this beauty wood, a neighborly day for a beauty wood. You be mine. Could you be mine? I have always wanted a neighbor like you. I have always wanted a friend just like you. to help our community come together if you want to get more opportunities me and mr rogers yeah we all it. i'm gonna make this place a better place i'm talking michigan dreaming about the neighbors that we need to have gotta be more kind to of others because we need to laugh and if we help each other we'll have a blast and if we put each other first we we'll never crash uh, for our community we should all come together provide a common better than sort on to something fresher and keep pushing until everybody get the message no mistakes we learn lessons God woke us up today, let's start counting our blessings Be honest and make confessions, cause time is of the essence To all the God, daughters and sons, a group of minds is stronger than one We can make our community better from trash to treasure But we can make it last forever, but as long as we strive The good is what keeps us alive You will always be remembered even when you die I just really wanna see you fly If we made a community that was good all around Let's build people up instead of trying to tear them down uh, so watch how your life will turn around You can make it out the darkness if you just fall alive Welcome to the neighborhood. Sorry to disappoint you that I'm not actually Mr. Rogers. <laughs> Nothing I could do about that, but I, my name is Craig Mays and I am the interim lead pastor here. And Welcome to the Neighborhood is the name of the new series that we're starting this week and then for the next two weeks. And we're going to have a great time exploring what it means to be a neighbor, what the Bible has to say about being a neighbor. And yes, we do have some things to learn from Mr. Rogers and I will be talking about that in just a little bit. But the first thing I have to share with you is just one word, coffee. Did you smell it when you walked in the lobby? Did you? Because you're, you're the second service, so the other ones, like, they can't even get in here without coffee. But moving forward, you don't need to stop at McDonald's or Panera Bread or you know, unless you have your Starbucks, you have your favorite coffee because we will be serving coffee. And I want to put our hands together for the team that got here at the crack of dawn today to make our coffee. <clears throat> and as you're, as you're thinking great thoughts about them, consider the possibility that maybe you're being called to be part of that team. You don't have to do it every Sunday. You can be in a rotation. We do need more volunteers. So after the service today, if you would stop by the hub and consider, you know, ask them some questions and figure out what it would mean for you to help bless our congregation with nice hot coffee and hot water every Sunday morning. So I do, um, as we uh, jump into our wonderful service today, I do have um, a couple things I want to share with you. The first is that we have an event coming up called Getaway. It's for the ladies only, and it's going to be held on March 18th, and there are, these flyers are out at the hub, out in the lobby, and you can also get information online, but it's going to be a one-day intensive day down in Detroit at this beautiful venue where we're going to be looking at the idea that women are, you're designed by God, and I have to tell you, honestly, they gave me all this copy about designers and sketches and seams and beads and fabric, and I just toss that away because it doesn't mean anything to me at all. But what I do know is that the clothes you wear were thoughtfully 
designed and you picked out the one that fits you and that looked good on you. And we want you to know, ladies, that God has designed you specifically and uniquely for a purpose. And so through great inspirational teaching and through some amazing hands-on, really practical workshops and through some great music and through some relationships and conversations over meals, you're going to have a great day. So please take care of this today if you can because it's limited to 300 women. And when we sell out, we sell out. But you can go online today as you can see the information on the screen and be a part of this getaway because don't you need to get away every now and then? So September 18th, mark it on your calendar and please consider showing up. Well, one of the things that we do this time of year, and we're going to do it again today, is we have the chance to hit the pause button and to think about and celebrate what God has done through us together this past year. And this past year was unlike any year in terms of its challenges and difficulties. But uh, God did amazing things in us and among us and through us, and we want to celebrate that. Now, if you were here last week, you're going to see a rerun. If you watched us online last week, you're going to see a rerun. And when I was a kid, before there was live streaming and on demand, you'd go to watch your favorite show. You'd sit down with your popcorn and you'd go, oh, it's a rerun. But every now and then there was a show you liked so much that you didn't mind watching it a second time. I hope this show for the next few minutes is that for you. It's our annual report where we're going to give you pictures and words and statistics to show what we've done together really as a way of celebrating. And then I'll come up and share just a few more words after this. So whether it's your first time or you're here last week, enjoy this. When we think about this past year, I'm sure many of us feel like we've traveled way more than just once around the sun. Was it really just 365 days as usual? I'm not sure. But so much good has happened at Kensington in this year like no other, which is evidence of God's grace and his presence. God is moving and it is so humbling to be a part of it. So let me ask you a question. What image comes to your mind when you think of a source of heat or energy? Maybe you're thinking of the sun, how its rays push back the darkness, or maybe even thinking about sound waves rushing out from a source. This is just a simple mental image of how God works right here at Kensington. At the center is God, and through us, his love and transforming power are radiating out to impact our church, our local communities, our nation, and even our world. God's power is limitless, and what he can do through a community of imperfect people who are passionate about the one is measureless. So let's celebrate together all he's done in our community this past year. Last June, our Traverse City campus relaunched in-person services, and in July, we reopened the rest of our campuses with limited capacity. Being able to gather together in the same place was so memorable and energizing. Our online presence is also very important. Over the past year, our services have been viewed more than 219,000 times. At most campuses, students return to K-Kids and student programs in November. But prior to that, our teams worked hard to provide ways to connect virtually and engage in creative ways. There were video lessons, carefully assembled monthly curriculum bags, over 3,500 total, and campuses hosted all kinds of connection events for families. We also encouraged over 1,000 families with free online faith and the family events, including faith habits in the family, coping with anxiety and stress with Dr. Jack Wilson, raising godly girls, raising godly boys, and no perfect parents with Kensington co-founders Dave and Ann Wilson. Over the past year, we supported marriages in a variety of ways. 250 couples picked up a holiday date night kit. Over 400 people attended our online marriage course and 174 marriage mentors personally encouraged other couples. With God at the center, radiating out his love, we can bravely step toward wholeness and community because we know it is God's nature to heal and redeem. Celebrate Recovery was the first ministry to return to in-person meetings last July. And before that, they held drive-by chip celebrations, recognizing each person's commitment to recovery and finding freedom through Jesus. At Kensington, we love celebrating baptisms. As people rise up out of the water, they are resurfacing with new life in Jesus. Last year, we held offsite baptisms in January and campus baptisms in May. Whether those 93 people were taking the plunge in a swim school or in front of a live congregation, this is an example of God at the center and change rippling out. Best way to describe at least my decision uh, for to choose to be baptized is really, really boiled down to like the three C's for yeah. me is um, the celebration, 
the commitment and the choice. So as much as I can appreciate it, it's a certainly a public declaration. For me, at least, it was certainly a very, very personal uh, declaration between me and God. If you joined us for Good Friday and Easter this spring, you know that the creative elements and the beautiful teaching on the humanity of Jesus left a powerful impression. More than 8,200 of you joined us for in-person services and over 12,000 of you joined us online. And there was a special original video created for our kids and watched by more than 800 families, which included an Easter explosion, a running pineapple, but most importantly, a lesson on the resurrection of Jesus. Let's talk about how God's love radiated out beyond our walls to impact our local communities. We call this putting love into action, moving out. They cared for the homeless, delivered food boxes, sewed masks, and provided meals for frontline workers, wrote notes of encouragement to teachers and staff, planted community gardens, provided learning resources to students, visited the elderly, tutored students, refurbished cars, and so much more. School partners amped up their back-to-school supply drive to help resource students for remote learning. Clinton Township partnered with Forgotten Harvest to launch a weekly mobile food pantry. Brazil Campus launched their first move out team, the Tabitha Project, to love and serve those in need. Traverse City launched six new move out teams, serving the under-resourced, mentoring students, and supporting foster families. We understand that holidays are hard for many people, especially during a pandemic. We're so grateful for the resources and volunteers which allowed us to put together and deliver 1,500 Thanksgiving baskets to local families from our partner schools. Again, at Christmas, we asked ourselves how best to serve our neighbors, and that was through you directly, the people in our seats. During services, we invited you to receive a $25 Meyer gift card or give it to someone in need. People responded wildly to this, often sharing the cards with others. And we gave away cards totaling over $21,000, which impacted over 600 families. With God at the center as a never ending, never drying up source, we don't have to ration out our resources. Instead, we turn with open hearts and hands toward the spiritual or physical needs within our state and nation. We're dedicated to planting new churches all over the country. To date, we have planted 97 churches nationally. And many of these churches have gone on to plant more churches, which means hundreds of thousands of people in the U.S. have heard about the hope and love of Jesus. This year, we've been working with seven new churches, all at different stages in the launching process. Imagine a major flood in the middle of this pandemic. When we offered a way to help Midland, you all jumped at the chance to bring hope to a devastating situation. We partner with one of our move out teams, Draw, Disaster Relief at Work, to provide essential supplies for immediate and long-term recovery efforts. During one Sunday morning in February, we shared that hundreds of thousands in Texas were without power and millions without water. And once again, partnering with our move out team, Draw, you immediately responded by donating over $20,000 funding more than half of the delivery and distribution of 4,600 cases of water to Houston, Dallas, and Tyler. At Kensington, we believe that we are called to show the love of God by meeting needs in His name around the globe. With God as the source, we reach out to build relationships and share resources with global partners in 10 different countries. Over the past year, we as a community have been supporting these on-the-ground leaders in two different ways. We help sustain them and the work they do in their local communities, and we stepped in when an emergency struck to equip them. When India experienced a second dangerous wave of COVID, our partner's private hospital was converted into an emergency COVID site at the request of the Indian government. I'm standing in front of the CM hospital, which is being used as COVID grade A hospital. And many lives are being saved in this pandemic situation of second wave of COVID-19. And many people are witnessing God's healing. We shared their need for beds, equipment, and supplies. And this open-handed community gave $200,000 to support them as they saved lives. Our partner Ruben in South Sudan shared that by God's grace, good things were still happening among the tribe he's working with. 40 churches were planted, 523 people became followers of Jesus, and 55 people were baptized. Last year in Afghanistan, where law prohibits converting to Christianity, our partner distributed more than 120,000 Bibles. 
the Hope Water Project team showed some creativity in order to support its mission to bring clean water to the Pokot tribe of Western Kenya. When we weren't able to hold our traditional fundraising events, there was an out-of-the-box virtual challenge called Every Mile Counts. People could walk, run, cycle, hold a movie marathon, or anything to raise money to dig clean water wells. And guess what? This community raised just over $170,000, which will dig six wells in Kenya. Literally thousands of lives will be changed. Education will be possible. Churches can be built. Herds can remain healthy and these villages can thrive. One of the highlights of this year has been the church planning initiative of our newest global partner. We recently shared our goal of planting a thousand churches in Northern India, which is a predominantly Hindu region. Our partnership with the Timothy Initiative will allow us to launch new churches for just $300 each. In just a few months' time, you have given over $200,000, which is 75% of the way to our goal. Only answer to reach these places is disciple makers who plant churches. And this is the only way that we can reach this huge number of villages. Wow, it is so incredible to hear about what God has done here and around the world through Kensington over the past year. Each one of you is an integral part of who we are and how we're blessing others in Jesus' name. You've probably heard it said before that the church is not the building and let's be the church the other six days of the week. And when you really listen to these two phrases, you hear how beautiful they are and how they reflect the heart of God and it reflects you. You've been that church. Thank you for giving your time and your financial gifts and your talents to make an impact on the lives of others. And in all of this, God's at the center. He's the source, and our privilege is to radiate out His love and light to the farthest most reaches of the earth. And I do wanna finish with a challenge for all of us, really two challenges. If this past year and what you've experienced has disconnected you from this community, I just urge you to please take steps to reconnect. We are better together. We need each other. Come back to an in-person service. Reach out to that friend or small group. Open yourself up again. And if you're here and connected, my challenge for you and me is this, let's continue. Let's keep pressing into the difficulties that life brings us, that we're all experiencing. And I would say maybe most of all, let's keep our hearts soft, soft to Jesus and to each other and to, to those in need. And keep our hands in a posture of open-handedness. That's always been our dream. And I just wanna finish by saying a huge thanks to all of you. I cannot thank God enough for you and I can't wait to see how God will work through us this coming year. Hey, let's, um, let's do a different kind of applause for that. Let's do what I call a God applause. Just put your hands up high because it's about him, right? I, uh, I have to agree with Steve when I watch that um, and just say, wow, like really, God, you did all of this? And he did it in us and through us. And that only happens if this is true. And it all begins with this. Jesus, there's two words of invitation that he shared with his followers 2,000 years ago, and he's been doing it ever since, and he does it today still. And the two words are, follow me. And when we say yes to follow him, everything begins to change. And what you saw on the screen, the evidence of life change and really community change and world change and provision and care and expressions of love happens because we say yes to Jesus, and then we, we become people of prayer, and we release our lives, we live open-handed where we release our resources to him, and uh, our finances and our, our, our service, our time, and we join together. And when you do that, when a group of people does that, this is what happens. Absolutely incredible. And I, I agree with Steve. I can't wait to see what's going to happen in the coming year. Now, the only thing that we need you to think about right now is that we've shown you this for two weeks to prepare you next Sunday, uh, August 29th. And if you're not with us here, we encourage you to try to come to the auditorium if you can. If not, you can go online and there's a way for, for you to vote. And we, we're, the vote is really affirming the budget for next year. Like, how are we going to leverage the resources that we all share together 
to impact our communities, our own lives, and the world. And then we also affirm our elders. And if you want to take a, a peek at the budget and learn who our elders are, then you can go online and uh, it's uh, hashtag uh, annual report and you can get all that information then come next week um, to, together for us to affirm how God is leading us in the coming year. So thank you uh, for being a part of that. Um, I do want to take just a moment to kind of hit the pause button and just embrace what's going on in the last week or so in our world. We have 11 global partners. You learned about a couple of them in the, in the video, but two are impacted by some world events that have happened in the last couple of weeks. Um, the first is not directly, uh, we have a global partner in Dominican Republic called Go Ministries, and they're on the same island as Haiti. And of course, the earthquake hit Haiti, and it's been pretty devastating. Uh, a few thousand lives have been lost, many more thousands have been injured. And Go Ministries is our global partner in Dominican Republic, and they're, they're now our, our way to help Haiti. So they have been raising resources and funds, and in fact, on Thursday, they sent a plane to Haiti that had 3,300 pounds of medical supplies, food, tents, just to begin to care for them. And we want to keep this going as long as we can. And so we're going to invite you, if God is leading you, if you feel prompted and you have the resources to make a special gift, 100% of anything you give will go there. There's no overhead. It goes 100% will get in the places of need in Haiti. Um, so consider doing that. You can see the information on the screen in terms of how you can participate in that. I think this will be another highlight reel for next year, just like what we saw in India with the COVID-19, with the hospital, that God keeps using us here in, in southeastern Michigan to love on people that are in difficult places in the world. Uh, the second place is Afghanistan. It's also one of our global partners. We don't say an awful lot about it because it's a difficult place to serve. It's especially been a difficult place to serve Jesus uh, openly and outwardly, even before the Taliban came in this last week and took over the country again. So just know that we have men and women and families that are there right now who are serving Jesus. Some of them are uh, pastors. They've planted churches. And now they're having to reevaluate everything. They're doing two things right now, and you can pray about these things. The first is they're trying to get as many people that are needing to leave the country as refugees uh, to a safe place. And it's a dangerous thing to do, and it's a hard thing to do, and they need discernment. And then the second thing is that they have to decide whether they're going to leave themselves or stay. And we don't have a lot of communication coming from them, but what we have heard is many are going to choose to stay to support their brothers and sisters in Christ who are there during this very difficult and dark time. So would you just join me um, for a few moments of prayer as we think about what's going on in these two places? God, we know this whole world belongs to you and you care about every square inch of it. And so as we have witnessed and through our TV screens and through the news, what's happened in both Haiti and Afghanistan, our hearts ache, we know your heart aches. And we would ask that you would care for them in a very tangible way, that you would leverage places like Kensington and others around the world that would pour resources in, that you would bring comfort and safety and discernment and wisdom and peace to them. And so God, we just, we love you and we, we just ask that you would work in a mighty, tangible way in their behalf. We pray this in your name. Amen. All right, as we continue the service, we're going to do the, the meet and greet thing, but I'm going to give you some qualifiers based on the chaos that happened last week. So, and I'm kind of joking, it was a little chaos. So some of you are ready to hug strangers, some of you are not. Some of you are ready to shake hands, some of you are not. Some of you still like six feet, some of you are happy with six inches. So you have to be mindful of the person around you. When I say get up, say hi to someone, do a fist bump, a handshake, or if, they're, if both of you have your arms open like this, that's a sign that you can hug. If someone sits down or goes under their chair, just leave them alone. <laughs> Um, I shouldn't, I actually, I shouldn't uh, make light of that because we are still at risk. There's still a problem. The pandemic is not done. So we want to be respectful of each other, but we also want to be friendly. So find some friendly, safe way to say hi to the people around you. Not too well. Uh, we've been in our house in the Detroit Ferndale area just for about two months. Not, not that well. well. Pretty well. I don't know them that well. Not very well. I don't know mine well either because they live so far like, away. 
I know some really well and then some not as well. Pretty well. Okay. Yeah, pretty well. Um, Kim. What's the other one? Donna. Mel. Oh. That's a lie. I don't know. Nope. <laughs> <laughs> Yvette, Danielle, Nikki, Mary Claire, Melissa. I think someone who's friendly, helpful if you need it, but minds their own business. I guess being considerate to to us, like not mowing the lawn at six in the morning. They must have pets, specifically dogs. <laughs> you can rely on them when you need to. In an apartment setting, quiet, no smoking, uh, you know, uh, friendly. Neighbors who help each other out, kind of look out for each other. Somebody who's always like in your business. I have one of those neighbors. A neighbor that yells all of the time or is like always blasting loud music. Like, or when they like have animals but they don't like keep control of them so they're going all over your yard or yeah. something. Really loud and, yeah. and obnoxious. Gigi, Daniela, Evan, Chad, and Stephanie. There's Tom and Deanna, and there's Joel and his wife, uh, I can't remember her name. So no, that's as good as I can do it for you. We always had our neighbors come over and, and visit when the kids were babies, and I always, I always liked that. Let me pet their dogs. <laughs> Let me spend the night when like I couldn't have my house because I got locked out. My neighbor always takes care of my lawn when I'm not home or something. A couple weeks ago when we had the tornado warning, I was at work and I was unable to be home with my children. They allowed my children to come down for better safety. Annette, Joe, Tom, Cindy, and Matt. Debbie, Aubrey, Heather, and I want to say Lisa. <laughs> Put a video camera on the back of his garage that um, taped me in my backyard and I didn't know it. We have neighbors that have parked their cars in front of our house and we have to kind of squeeze our garbage cans into this one zone. Called the cops and animal control on my dog and then hauled the cops to my dog's head. Um, one of my neighbors has like a really scary dog and it like chases after people. When we were building a pool I had the, my neighbor call the city and make us move all of our lines because they were convinced it was on their property when it wasn't. He was mowing the lawn and him and his wife got in a fight and when he was done mowing the lawn, his wife started doing donuts in the yard to mess up the newly mowed lawn. So that was, I mean, it was funny, but it was quite the scene. <laughs> One of my neighbors has a really big dog and it peed on our lawn and left a huge yellow stain. My neighbor's dog tried to attack my dog and then yelled at me for keeping my dog not under control. My coworker, her neighbor stole her dog and then sold it and then they never saw the dog again. Susan, Michelle, Sue's mom, Sue, Dan and Nancy. And Mike's on the other side, and John's on the other side of him. And across the street is Tim's son, Tom. OK, that was fun. Two lessons learned. Get rid of your dog, <laughs> or they're going to steal it anyhow and sell it. And you'll never see your dog again. Um, second thing is, didn't the women do a lot better knowing the names? Is that any surprise to anybody here that that's the case? I'm not even, the women aren't even applauding that. I thought you'd be happy that I, I actually called that out. But anyhow, yeah, there we go. There we go. So uh, Mr. Rogers, um, through his television program, which aired between, I think, 1968 and early 2000s, he became a familiar face, voice, a presence um, in his setting with puppets and trains and just his gentle voice and really a vision for what a neighbor could be. Um, I have to confess because of my age that when he started airing in 1968, I was too old and cool to watch that. And then when I had kids, other shows were competing now. And, and unfortunately, my daughter liked Barney. I've been in therapy since watching Barney. Some of you don't know who Barney is. Don't Google it. You'll be in therapy. Uh, I can still hear his voice and his songs. And then SpongeBob, which I have to confess I loved. There's so many great, I'm sure, moral stories in, like Mr. Rogers and SpongeBob. But, you know, that's what drew them to the TV. So I'm not really all that familiar with Miss, Mr. Rogers, except just he's a social icon and we kind of know who he was. But uh, on Wednesday, I was making a trip to come back from New York to Michigan to be here this weekend. And 
I thought I should do a little research. I've got my message pretty much done, but I should do some research. And so I got the Tom Hanks movie where he portrayed Mr. Rogers, and I downloaded it onto my iPad so I could watch it. And as I'm settling into my seat, literally a fight broke out between two passengers. You've probably seen in the news a lot of this is going on. Just heightened emotion, anger, words exchanged. I'm trying to stay out of it. Um, but I was thinking all kinds of unkind thoughts, very Mr. Unrogers like about what was going on. And then we get up in the air, and I open up my iPad, and I start watching it. How many have seen the movie? You maybe didn't have the same reaction as me, but I cried so many times, so hard, sitting on the plane, and I'm embarrassed because people around me can see I got snot coming down. And then they go on to see, what is he watching? <laughs> He's watching Mr. Rogers. Like, what's wrong with this guy? But part of it was I was aware of the, of the hardness of my heart toward these two people who I know nothing about in judging them, and then I'm watching this extremely kind person that you want to be your neighbor. You know, your dog could, could pee in his yard and he'd be okay with that. He's not gonna steal your dog. In fact, Mr. Rogers is, is the kind of guy that, you know, you rake your leaves, or he rakes his leaves and you don't, and then the wind blows and it all goes in his yard. He'd just go out and rake them again. Um, I remember, um, anybody have difficult neighbors? Don't raise your hand in case someone's watching, but you know, the reality is that some brave people are still raising their hands. Um, the reality is that neighbors can be hard. We want to gloss that over. This can be difficult. This is maybe the acid test of following Jesus. But I remember years ago when I lived in Michigan, I had a boat. And the ordinance in our subdivision is you cannot park your boat on your driveway for more than two days. Um, and you have to take it out. So I had a boat and I had some repair I was trying to do on it. And it didn't get it done in two days. So I was day three. Well, who cares, right? Suddenly someone shows up from the city and hands me a ticket, a violation. So I actually said to the guy, what, do you drive around looking for boats and yards and you count how many days? He goes, no, a neighbor called and complained. And I'm like looking around saying, I bet you it was this person or that person, whatever. But you know what? This is what Mr. Rogers would do. He would be counting the days. When he got into day three, he'd show up with a tool belt on saying, I notice you're struggling. I'm a pretty good mechanic. Let's see if I can help you on this. Like, that's the vision that he gave through his television show of kindness and love and expression of all of that. And so we're going to um, press into the, what it means for strangers to become neighbors. And the question I want you to ask yourself to try to make this as practical as possible as we move forward is, honestly, and this is a question just for you, what kind of neighbor am I, really? What kind of neighbor are you? Before we try to answer that question, help you answer that question, we're going to take a moment to receive our offering. And again, I, I don't really think I need to say too much about that because what, what you just saw in the end report is what happens when we give. When we share our resources and, and God blesses them and uses them, it really changes lives, whether it's baptisms right here in our backyard or it's around the world. So thank you again. You can give. If you're here today with us, you can give on your way out. There's buckets in the back. If, you're, uh, if you prefer, you can give online or through the app or you can mail a check-in. And again, thank you for your partnership with us in the work of Jesus in our community and around the world. So, you can, do you know what cliff notes are? Cheaters. <laughs> if you know the answer to that question, you're a cheater. Cliff notes is, let's say you're in a literature class in college and you have to read a certain book and you really don't want to read it or you're a procrastinator and you have a report due by a certain date and you wait till like the day before and you haven't read the book, much less written the report. So you go grab something called cliff notes. I can't imagine, by the way, what's available online now. You can probably just get the report, change a few words, submit it. But um, it would sum up the, the main characters, the theme, the plot, the story, the application, what it means. It would give all of that to you, kind of dumb it down, and you could base your report just on that and turn it in. I'm not admitting that I ever did that, by the way. <laughs> and I'm not denying that I ever did that either. So let's talk about a book that's pretty complex. You've read parts of the Bible. Some of you have read all the Bible. Some of you read through the Bible every year or so. But if, if we're honest, this is kind of complicated, isn't it? You got the Old Testament, New Testament. It's, um, it's kind of relayed chronologically, but not entirely in the Old Testament. And there's duplication, and sometimes you can't put the old and new together. There's no table of contents. There's no index by subject. And so it can be kind of complicated. So, like, could we have, like, Cliff Notes version of this? Could you just dumb it down to, for us? Give us the bottom line. What's this really all about? And actually, someone did write a book like that, and you'll see it on the screen, The Bible for Dummies. Um, but by the way, don't go to Amazon right now and order it. Did you, did you have one? She has the book. Can we call you dummy? Okay. Don't, don't order the book, though. You know why? 
It's 443 pages. It's like, no, that, I need it. I mean, I need low shelf. Come on. Four, you, you're going to sum it up in 443 pages. But the truth is that Jesus was asked, kind of for the Cliff Notes version, on more than one, of a, one occasion. And I'm going to tell you in advance the punchline to this message. And it's the Cliff Notes version, the low shelf version of what is this book all about can be summed up in three words. Only three words. And we're going to get there eventually. We're going to start with more words and then we're going to whittle it down to just three words. Well, Jesus was asked a couple times for the Cliff Notes version, in a sense. Um, and the first is found in Matthew 22, the first that we're going to look at. So hearing that Jesus had silenced the Sadducees, which is a group of religious leaders that didn't like Jesus, they're always testing him. The Pharisees, who didn't like Jesus and were always testing him, got together. One of them, an expert in the law, tested him with this question. Teacher, which is the greatest commandment in the law? Of course, there were 10 commandments, and then the Pharisees had added about 400 and some additional nuances of those commandments. And they, this is an expert now. And he asked the question, what is the, key word there, the, come on, can you just give it to me, cliff notes, what is the greatest commandment? And then in Luke chapter 10, we're told on one occasion, an expert in the law stood up to test Jesus. So this is another expert. He already knew the answer, but he's trying to trick Jesus, and he says, teacher, he asks, what must I do to inherit eternal life? So I know there's a lot of words in here. For them, it would have been the, the law and the prophets that they would have had. They already knew all of that, but they're saying, Jesus, can you just kind of sort through all the confusion that might be there and, and all of that and just give us, like, what is the thing? What is the Cliff Notes version? The greatest commandment, how to have eternal life. And so Jesus answered by giving them the one thing. In fact, in one case, he turned it back to the expert who answered correctly. In the other case, Jesus actually gave the answer. And here's, here's how it's recorded in Mark 12. He said, Jesus now speaking, love the Lord your God with all your heart and with all your soul and with all your mind and with all your strength. And the second is this, love your neighbor as yourself. There is no commandment greater than these. So pretty easy, right? He didn't give him one though, he gave him two. Love God with everything you are and then love your neighbor. And so we could stop there and say, well, that's more than three words, but it kind of lays it out there that what God is most interested in is love because he is the God of love and to love him and to love your neighbor. But very interesting, and I would say almost astonishing, that when Paul picks up the pen to write the letters of the New Testament, on two occasions, he takes it even simpler and lower and shorter. So this is the extreme Cliff Notes version of what this whole thing is all about. And this is where we're going to find the three words. The first place we find this is in a book called Galatians in the New Testament. And Paul says this, for the entire law, by the way, he was a Pharisee. He was an expert in the law before he came to Jesus. The entire law is fulfilled in keeping this one command. Love your neighbor. As yourself, there are five words, but we're going to focus on those three. Paul says, everything is summed up actually in loving your neighbor. And if you're thinking about this, or if you're an expert because you've read the Bible for Dummies here, you think, but that doesn't really make a lot of sense because God's got to be the center of everything. So how can you like, push God aside and say, just love your neighbor? Well, for good measure, Paul, when he writes to the Romans, says it this way. The commandments, you shall not commit adultery, you shall not murder, you shall not steal, you shall not covenant, and whatever other command there may be, and there's many of them, are summed up in this one command, love your neighbor. And you know, we could just brush by that, but I think we ought to sit in it for a moment. And I want to I wanna ask myself, wow, I mean, that means when, when God is looking at Craig, and boy, he's, he's not impressed that I'm a pastor or I'm teaching right now, any more than he's impressed with anyone else. When he looks at our lives, he's saying, I want to see love for neighbor. Because everything's summed up in that. It's the greatest commandment. It's really what it's all about in the end. And if we stay in this moment for just a little bit, we could say, but, but isn't loving God really where it all starts? And the answer, of course, is yes. It, it does all start there. But do you know how easy it would be for me to tell you, oh, I love God. But if you don't know me very well, if I'm not your neighbor, if I don't live in your subdivision three doors down, you don't know anything about me. You can't test that. That's untestable almost, except where it finds its expression. 
if I'm your neighbor and I say, oh, I love you, neighbor, and you think to yourself, no, you don't, because <laughs> I got plenty of evidence that you're not loving me, then, then the reality is I don't love God because loving my neighbor is the ultimate final expression of whether I love God or not, and that one is testable. There's evidence for it or against it. Um, there's, there's plenty that would back up this thesis that I'm sharing with you, but we're going to look at um, one passage in 1 John chapter 4 where he says it this way, and these are pretty strong words. He says, whoever does not love does not know God because God is love. And again, how do we test that love? Not through words, but through the kind of people we are with each other. And then even stronger, he says, whoever does not love their brother and sister, and I'm going to put in their neighbor, whom they have seen, cannot love God whom they have not seen. And so the point of this is not that the goal of life isn't to love God, but the test of whether we love God is whether we love our neighbor. The evidence, rather, is a better way of putting it. The evidence of whether or not I love God is whether or not my neighbors feel loved by me. And if they don't, then John is being bold enough to say, Craig, you, don't, you, cannot, you cannot love God then if you're not loving your neighbor. So if, we, if we're willing to embrace this truth, this is pretty simple but pretty deep stuff. And it's pretty challenging stuff because in the end, it'll point, when I put my head on the pillow at the end of my day, the question I should be asking is not whether I love God, but whether I love my neighbor. I didn't say that. Paul said it twice. It's in the Bible. It's in the New Testament. So this business of loving our neighbor is really everything. And so we're taking three weeks to really press into this because it's pretty extraordinary to me. Love our neighbor, three words, love your neighbor. Now, often when we talk about this, and, and I've preached so many sermons on Luke 10, we go to that story. Because in Luke chapter 10, uh, Jesus is questioned, and he says, love God with all your heart, soul, strength, and mind, and your neighbor. And then the expert asks Jesus another question. Remember what it is? Well, who is my neighbor? And what he was trying to do was shrink the field from everybody to maybe a select few. Like, who is my neighbor? And in telling the story of the Good Samaritan, if you're familiar with it, where a stranger helps someone on the road who's half dead and takes care of them, the goal of that parable was to expand the word neighbor to not literally your neighbor, but everybody that you're in proximity with who has a need that you could help. You're, we're called to love that person. That's not where we're going today. We're going to actually narrow it down to our actual neighbors. The people that live on your street, next door, across the street, through the backyard, down the street, your subdivision, your neighborhood, your apartment complex, your mo mobile home park, wherever it is that you live, we're going to focus on that. What does it mean to love my actual neighbors? You know, it's funny how uh, times have changed from when I was a kid. Man, I, I hate to be old enough now where I'm always talking about when I was a kid and how much the world has changed. I remember when people did that when I was young and it annoyed me. And now I'm annoying some of you right now. Sorry about that. But, you know, think about, you know, that man on, the, man on the street video you saw where people couldn't name five neighbors by name. And they may have lived there 10, 20, 30 years. And when I was growing up, what we actually did was we sat on our front porches. And people would walk by, walking their dog or, pull, you know, pushing a stroller. And we'd shout out names. And maybe they would come up and sit a spell. Did, did I just say that? Sit, sit a spell? Am I Andy Griffith, really, on Mayberry right now? <laughs> Sit a spell. Would you like some iced tea? I notice you got a new lawnmower. Your lawn looks great. How's Kathy doing? Like, that's how it, it, it was conducive to getting to know people. And this is just my opinion, but we went from front porches to back patios and decks. And we built privacy fences and shrubs. And we go down our street and we click the garage door opener, and the garage goes up, we pull the car in, we shut the garage door, we go inside, and then we exit out the back door, and there's nobody walking by in your backyard. If there is, you should call the police. <laughs> it's changed, and we don't, we don't know. In fact, most of our friends, and this is true of me, um, don't live near me. Um, when I lived in Michigan, I'd get in the car and drive to be with my friends, to get dinner, to go to a movie, go to a ball game, and then when I get home, I you know, pull into my neighborhood, and I drive 25 miles an hour, um, past people I don't know, 
even though I've lived there for 10 years and into my garage. And so, so things have really changed. It's not the way it was. And we want to talk about that in very practical ways in terms of understanding. And I'm going to ask you a question to consider. What is your vision for your neighborhood? How would you do on the man on the street interview if they interviewed you? How many neighbors do you know? How can strangers become true neighbors? People to know and people that you can love. God has revealed to us the one thing that he's most interested in as he watches us in all of our busy lives, and it's this. Craig, I'm watching you. Do you know your neighbors? Did you hear that? Could it be someone at the door, you think? Should I go open it? Probably. No? Somebody said no? Okay. Somebody said no. Let's see. Oh, my gosh. I got visitors. Oh, it's Joe. Joe Graney. Man, good to see you. And Cappy, come on in. Hey. All right. Thank you for interrupting my sermon. Oh, absolutely. Actually, this is the sermon. I'm just going to tell you right now, if you haven't heard anything I've said, this is what you need to hear. So let me tell you first who these people are. Uh, Cappy, uh, when I joined the staff at Kensington for the first time in 2000, Cappy was my executive assistant. What, what a horrible job to have to be my assistant because I lose, misplace, forget things, and she was like, where are my glasses? They'd be on my head, you know, that kind of thing. Okay. And then Joe, um, Cappy's husband, had a men's group that he invited me to join. I was new to the community. Tuesday, mor- uh, Tuesday at noon, um, guys that l- worked in the area would, you know, take their lunch break, and, and Joe's a fantastic cook. And he'd make, grill some food, and then we'd sit inside and eat, eat a meal together and talk about Jesus. So I've known them for over 20 years. Um, but right now, they're the people I stay with when I'm in Michigan. Some of you wondered where I am when I, I'm here, because I'm here about 40, sometimes 50% of the month. And you probably pictured me in this dingy Motel 6, just suffering, right? But um, in they the invited... down by the river. <laughs> in the van down by the river, he said... No, I, um, I, I was invited into their home. They have their empty nesters. They have a spare bedroom, bathroom, back deck. It's been absolutely wonderful. They feed me a place to sleep. Um, even did my laundry a few times. I didn't even ask, and I come home, and it's all folded on the bed. Yeah. And, yes, and Joe, you didn't do that, right? It was I didn't okay. Yes. Just Not had to check. <laughs> and uh, and they even, even one time, Joe washed my car. And I, I did want to tell you, I looked this morning. It's kind of in yeah. need again, just yeah. if... If you're not doing anything this afternoon, but um, one of the greatest joys for me has not, not only been this friendship renewed again um, and having a place to be in community, but watching their neighborhood. It's extraordinary. What you're going to hear in the next 10 minutes, I think, is absolutely extraordinary in terms of what's happened. So um, let's talk about that. So you, you moved into this neighborhood when? Uh, five years ago this weekend. Oh, this weekend. Okay, yep. so five-year anniversary. Yep. I know that you lived in Troy for almost 20 years yep. near, near the Troy campus because that's where we had our men's uh, group meeting. Right. So now I want you to picture in your mind their U-Haul or whatever truck you had pulling down the street by strangers. They don't know anybody. And back into the driveway and things are unloaded and your furniture and pictures and stuff, you've got a lot of work to do. You've got walls to paint. You've probably got things to demo uh, just to get settled in. But you, you came into a new place, and you, so you lost your community you are in. Now you have this new possible community, but it's not there yet. So what did that feel like? Just tell me what was in your heart and mind as you, as you did that. Well, we were really excited to be there. Uh, we had put in two uh, offers on two different homes, two different communities that w- were not accepted, and then this one was. And when we came into the, into the neighborhood, we just knew this is where um, God wanted us. And uh, so we were excited to be there. Our next door neighbors were in Europe when we moved in, so we didn't get to see them right away. But once, we, once they came back and we started some conversations, we invited them over, and we just uh, sat around and t- talked for a few hours, and then, oh my gosh, it's almost dinner time, so we threw some hamburgers on the grill, and they stayed, it was just very warm and just very nice. Yeah. You know, it's interesting, so one of the things just to notice there was, they took the first move. Like, like you'd like to believe that it's, you know, back when we used to sit a spell, <laughs> that, you know, the new people, the doorbell would ring, here's a plate of chocolate chip cookies. I'm, st- I'm sure that still happens sometimes, but, you know, that's how you'd like to believe that you're coming into a community as a new people, and they're going to reach out to you, and they're going to welcome you. Um, but instead, you were very intentional about that. Now, you, you told me a story one time about actually the first time you were kind of recognized in the neighborhood, and it had to do with painting your house. I, I'd like to hear that. Yeah, well, we had, a, we had a really different color house, 
and it was red brick with the trim wasn't all that pretty. So we. You mean uh, it was ugly? I mean, yeah. An eyesore. Sure. But uh, this is this church, is so I don't want to. Oh, but, by the way, they bought the house from someone who goes to Kensington, so, yeah, so I just deeply offended somebody here, so I apologize. But so, so, so what well, happened? Anyway, so we, we painted, the, painted the house, and that's when we met everybody because they all came out of their homes and thanked us for painting wow. the house. Yeah. I mean, even the mail carrier stopped <laughs> and, and, and said, nice place. Yeah. yeah. Well, and they told me the story a while ago, and one of the funny parts of it is that your very next door neighbor on one side is a widow. Um, and she, she said that she liked the new color and she was happy, but it, it really frustrated her because she used to tell people uh, her address, but just go past the ugly house and I'm the next house in town. <laughs> so she said, I lost my bearings there with my friends. But anyhow, and, and uh, so you have this initial next door neighbor, you invite him over for just maybe a casual conversation, it ends up a whole evening mm -hmm. and it began a friendship there. So this is August, September of... Uh, five years ago. So as we move into the fall now toward Christmas, I know there's something, Cappy, that really weighed on your heart that you did. Yeah, so I, I didn't know any of the neighbors yet. And um, again, we come home from work or you get the mail, you kind of wave. And I thought, you know what? Um, I would love to know them and we would love to get them to know who we are. So we decided we would have our first annual Jingle Mingle. And it was just a little Saturday afternoon cocktail party before Christmas. Um, handmade invitations and took the five neighbors right around us and put invitations in their mailbox and hoped for the best. Cool. So. By the way, you know it's a felony to open someone's mailbox. Oh, yeah. So I'm going to have to report you, you after the service. Report me? But go right You're that okay. kind of neighbor? All right, yeah. so the five, five. That's right, that's the kind of neighbor you. <laughs> oh, good oh, one. That's a good one. <laughs> You, you think on your seat. That's really good. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> so, um, so you sent five invitations out. Yeah. How, many, how many said yes? Uh, all five. And uh, we were so excited about that. But we thought, what are they thinking? You know, here are these newbies that moved into this neighborhood. What's their motive for doing this? Yeah. So, so how did the evening go? Was it awkward? Was it? Well, they came in with some trepidation. And they're, they're just like, Okay, we're here, and they were like waiting for a message. Uh, is he going to talk about Amway? Is he going to talk <laughs> about? Is he going to evangelize? What? What? What's? What's? Something's coming, but nothing came. We just had uh, just warmness, connected. just yeah. connected, and just uh, curious, yeah. and uh, the evening was wonderful. So I, I know because I moved in um, in October of last fall that you guys have continued that tradition. Um, we'll talk about how the pandemic impacted it in just a moment, but yeah. it's still going. Tell us yeah. about that. Yep, still going. So, and every year it gets a little bit bigger, a little bigger and a little bit bigger, and now they're in the basement, and now it's like seven hours long, and everybody's yeah. bringing in food, and, yeah, and awesome. it's great. We're, you know, we're playing games, we're hanging out, we're connecting. And, yeah. yeah. You know, one of the things, too, that um, the neighbors began to share is that before you guys came, came here, this never happened. People were not with a few exceptions, ever in anyone else's home. So they might learn a name, they might learn to wave, but it never crossed you in the threshold into someone else's house. And so now, five years into this, you've got 15, 20, 25 people yeah. Oh, yeah. in your house and just sharing conversation. And the other thing, I remember you telling me that you, how you communicate now. How do you communicate with each other? We have a group text. So um, you guys have group yeah. text? You have one in your neighborhood? I don't. So imagine a change that in just five years where now there's a whole community that has each other's cell numbers and when something good or bad is happening, there's a need, uh, they can text each other. In fact, there was something your widow, the widow that lives next door yeah. had, a, had a need and you used the, the text, the group text. Got the text out because uh, her, the guy that took care of her lawn uh, was, uh, fell ill, was in the hospital. She comes over, she's apologizing. Oh, I'm so sorry, my lawn's getting bit, uh, too overgrown and stuff. It's, don't worry about it. I picked up the text, got a couple of the guys. We went over there. We had two lawnmowers going, the trimmers going, and we just took care of it for her. It just, you know. Yeah, isn't that a beautiful picture to think about that? Yeah, that this, this woman who can't do it herself, suddenly she's got guys showing up around, that live around her, uh, serving her. And, yeah. and I know that he also, when he uh, shovels his driveway, he shovels her. Yeah. I mean, they didn't, by the way, they were a little bit reluctant to do this because they're not saints and they don't want to look like they're bragging. No. But I said, we want, I just want to share this story. But so one time it happened to snow when I was here in, in the wintertime. And so I got out my shovel to help Joe clear the snow. And it got all done. And I was feeling really proud of myself. And he said, we're not done. And he pointed at his neighbors 
I said, you do her driveway too? And he said, yep. Mm -hmm. So just, just bringing that spirit, that demonstration of love into the neighborhood has been uh, absolutely amazing. Yeah. So, all right, pandemic, uh, isolation, six feet, stay at home, shelter at home, all of yeah. that that we had to do. Um, you did something in the middle of that or maybe partway through that that built community in your neighborhood. Tell us about that. Yeah, so we ended up um, one Saturday, spur of the moment, going out and using sidewalk chalk from our grandkids and drawing big polka dots on the driveway, six feet apart, sent out a group text and said, hey, if you, if you want some connection and community, come on over, bring your own chair at um, three o'clock and we're gonna hang out on the driveway. And at five to three, all these doors start opening and these chairs start coming across and coolers start coming mm -hmm. across. Yeah. And, um, and here it was, you know, April, yeah. in Michigan and who cared we were we were out there in community and it got bigger and bigger and it spread across the lawn and people that were driving by or had dogs were waving and they're like hey what are you doing and we said you want to join us and yeah. uh, and they did that as well so yeah. it's interesting as I've gotten to know neighbors they tell me these stories I mean they've said things like the grannies coming into our neighborhood has transformed it it's built we went from strangers to neighbors and it built community uh, I wish we had more time. There's so many great stories, but let's let's finish with um, something happened this summer, um, and it was on a Sunday. Uh, why don't you guys just tell the story? Yeah, I had run into some medical issues and had weight restrictions. I had to stay off my feet. Uh, previous to that, I had uh, got all the landscaping supplies uh, to do, you know, the spring cleanup and, and freshen up, and then I, so I had a bunch of bags of mulch, and I couldn't move them. And I'm just laying on the couch, and then you, Joe's next door, and he, go ahead. Yeah, looked out the front door, and there's one of our neighbors, and they're um, spreading mulch in, in, along the front garden. And I walked out and said, hey, what are you doing? And he said, well, I know Joe can't do this, so I just wanted to come out and help. And I said, no, no, that's a lot. I mean, that's going to take all day. I'll be out to help you. And he said, and it was, yeah, it was warm, and he said, Nope, I got this. And I said, well, why are you doing this? And um, his reply was? I, I, I want to follow your example. I, told you, I just want to follow your example. Yeah. Isn't it so amazing? To just that, yeah. Yeah, yeah, to God. Um, and I, I have to say this neighbor, I've gotten to know him because um, he's over on their back deck with his wife from time to time and in the driveway talking. And uh, I had, a, I had a, something I needed to haul up to Northern Michigan early in the summer and I didn't have a car to do it. I have a little Chevy Cruze. And he said, well, you can take my truck. And I said, you don't even know me. And this is literally what he said. I know, but I know them. <laughs> and then he's retired and the next day he, when he saw me out in the driveway, he came over and he said, listen, I'm retired. If you, if you want company, I'd love to go with you. And we ended up not making the trip, but I mean, to me, that's extraordinary community that's being built and, and literally if we had more time there's so many more stories but um, I got a few last things I want to say um, so I'm going to go ahead and um, invite you to leave Mr. Rogers neighborhood okay. All right. this time but thank you Thanks for, for joining us, us. <clears throat> and Joe uh, don't forget um, about my car later yeah, today that's, right. that's so. where I'm headed <laughs> I, um, I really have become a part of this neighborhood it's been so fun um, I've had a little bit of a rough summer. Some of you don't know, but I got on June 11th, I got in a bike accident in New York City. I was going 15 miles an hour down Park Avenue. And right when I got to the back of this SUV, he swung his door open. I hit it, went over the door into Park Avenue, 10 hours in the ER room. Some, I have some fractured ribs. I had a little break in my leg. Pretty, a pretty rough time. And I, I came back to Michigan, and Joe and Cappy are helping to nurse me into health. And then about a month ago, I was going to visit someone who was very sick, and I wanted to make sure that I was vaccinated, but I just wanted to make sure. So I got tested, and I was positive. And while I'm talking to the doctor, they're listening to my lungs, and I told them about the fractured ribs. They said, you know, when you fracture your ribs, you can have problems with pneumonia coming in because you don't breathe right. And over time, fluid, and they're listening. They said, yeah, you're, we're a little concerned about you. Here's an antibiotic. Please take it easy. So I go home, and I tell Cappy this, and literally within five minutes, there's a woman at the front door walking in with a pulse ox, thing and and it's like who's this so this is so and so my neighbor and she lives a few doors down and she's a respiratory therapist and she's going to help you and so she gave me a pulse ox to keep for a week so I could test my oxygen level and then she right there in the front hallway 
gave me training on how to breathe and how to nurse my lungs back to health, which was extraordinary, and she didn't even charge me for that. And then the next week, every time, uh, if she drove by and I was anywhere visible, she'd roll her window down and ask how I was doing. I mean, these, this is the community that she has, part of that text thread. She just put a text out to her. Uh, the guy across the street's a real crack up. Uh, he's an EMS driver. He heard, heard about my accident, um, EMS technician. He uh, heard about my accident. And so while I was quarantined with COVID, uh, I, I'm not really sick and I can't see anybody. I put a bike in the back of my car. I was going to go over to Stony Creek just to bike, just to get outside. He knew about my accident, right? So he's across the street and he goes, hey, Craig. I go, what? He goes, watch out for doors. <laughs> so when they start teasing you, you know you're invited in community. What, a, what an amazing experience. I don't think I've ever had a neighborhood that I've lived in that has demonstrated that kind of care and love. So here's the challenge as we wrap this up. This is the way of the kingdom of Jesus that he's building. It's small things. Anybody can do this. You know, we think it needs to be big and grandiose, or maybe even worse, we think that Jesus is asking us to go door to door and get people saved. I, that's, by the way, how I grew up in my church. Think about meeting your neighbors in this way. If Joe and Kepi had moved in and said, okay, we don't know if anybody here knows Christ, so we're going to find out. So, Because I actually did this at one season in my life. Go ring the doorbell to a stranger, but they live in your neighborhood. They open the door and you say, hey, I'm Craig. I have a question for you. Um, if you died tonight, do you know if you go to heaven or hell? Like you're not saying, oh, that's your dog. What's his name? Um, or I, I noticed you have an, uh, I saw that new lawnmower you are using the other day. Uh, I, I need a new lawnmower. What brand is it? Can I take a look at it? Like not life, not interest in them as a person. They're a project to get converted. And I, I, I grieve over that, that that's what I did for years of my life when I was younger. Anybody can do what they did. We all can. Kindness, friendliness, invite, take initiative, invite them over, offer them a cup of tea on a hot day, invite them to come to the back deck with some other neighbors and, and, and you're going to grill for them. Just the very simple things is where the work of God can begin and it's not an agenda, they're not projects, they're people to be loved and to be loved deeply. John said this in, first, in his, his letter as well, he, he asked a question or made a statement, if anyone has material possessions and sees a brother or sister in need, but has no pity on them, then how can the love of God be in that person? And then here's the challenge. Dear children, let us love not with words or speech, but with actions and in truth. Um, I officiated at a wedding uh, this week, and the couple chose 1 Corinthians 13 as a passage to be read. It's very common, where it says, if I speak with tongues of men and angels and I don't have love, I am a clanging gong or cymbal. You know what, you know what that's saying? We can talk a good talk, we can share the gospel, but if we are not filled with love and overflowing with love, then we're just making noise. It's kind of like the gong show. Anybody old enough to remember the gong show? This was the forerunner, by the way, to um, The Voice, um, America's Got Talent, those kind of shows, right? Because you perform and then the judges tell you whether you're good or not. With the gong show, they didn't even wait. Halfway through your song, if you weren't good, someone would get the thing, go up and bong this thing gong and it would reverberate and you'd be walked in shame off stage. That's kind of the image that I get when I look at 1 Corinthians 13 that says, if, if Craig, if I'm not living a life of love, then just shut up because you're just making noise. It's just background noise. That love in the end is supreme. It's the most critical thing. Um, it's funny, the day that Kathy went home and they had that mulch story happen, um, it was on a Sunday and the message that I gave um, was anchored in uh, Matthew chapter 5, verse 16, where Jesus said, let your light shine before men so they will see your good works. Not hear. See good works, and that will point them to God, which is what is happening in their neighborhood. It's about how we live. It's living in a way that demonstrates love in tangible, real ways, real care, learning names, learning children's names, and the grandkids come over, your next door neighbor, you've taken the time to know who they are, even though they're loud and somewhat annoying. It's what we do. We really genuinely love our neighbors. And in the end, that ultimately is the first step to point people to the God that's behind all of this because we do this because he first loved us. We love, John said, because he first loved us. So I want to give you a vision to think about and consider embracing. The vision is this, that strangers becoming neighbors through expressions of radical hospitality and love. That's the beginning, the middle, and the end. Strangers becoming neighbors 
to radical expressions of radical hospitality and love. And by the way, this can be store, found in the story of the gospel. The whole essence of the gospel, what we call the incarnation of God, is that God came, if I can put it this way, the story of Jesus is God coming and moving into your neighborhood, into our neighborhood. He didn't send somebody to rescue us or to love us or to care for us or show compassion or kindness or make sacrifice for us. He came himself and moved in. And if that's what God did, then what do you think he might be asking me to do, you to do? To live incarnationally. And I'll finish with this, just one simple phrase. This is what it means. The incarnation means to me. God among us, and now us among others. God among us, it's the essence of the gospel story. And then life after that, as we follow Jesus, is us, me, among others. So God, thank you for the challenge of your word. Thank you for the example of the Grainies, and I'm sure many others in our church that are living this out. I just praise you for that. Help me to be better at it. Challenge me, convict me, give me courage. Help me to take initiative. Help me to be the light that shines brightly so that people would see you, not me, but they would see you. We pray this in your name. Amen. So this last song we're going to sing, um, I actually wrote about three years ago. It's called Let Love Guide. But as we were playing this service, we just thought that this was the perfect moment to share this as this song is about really choosing people over yourself, learning how to let go of your own pride and your own ego to allow God to lead you, to allow love to lead you to the direction of serving others and essentially what we've been talking about today and following that greatest commandment of loving your neighbor. to find the ones that need you. Stand up tall and fight for the weakest. I want to hear you say, well done. I boldly step into the darkest corner. Shine a light that far exceeds my word. a life that's more than just pleasing. I want to hear you say, well done. I want to hear you say, well done. Yeah. Because I want to fly past myself serving eagle. Soar through the sky to see the ones in need. Chase after your heart, God, because you're the one I'll follow. Land on your word and let love guide the way. Gonna let love guide the way. Gonna let love guide the way. I'll have a love that saturates my neighbor. Serve them until they meet your wonder. Promote their dreams, because it's the one that matters. I want to hear you say, well done. I want to hear you say,
my heart only want to serve when it comes to you your love exceeds it all you gave me that command and I will obey so let my life be stronger than these words and let my heart Thank you, Aaron. That's, that's so beautiful. It's really summed up in that last refrain, let love guide the way. Um, as we were singing that or as I was hearing the words, I, was, I had this picture of, um, you know, keeping my eyes fixed on Jesus because it does have to really start there. So I picture I'm looking at Jesus. He's looking at my eyes. I know he loves me. I'm feeling deeply loved by him because that's, that's the foundation of everything. I know he loves me, even in my failures. And I'm in my neighborhood. And as we're looking at him, he goes like this kind of one of those things, like, oh, what? Well, next door. Like, let's look next door. Let's consider next door. You know, across the street, I think you heard that Betty just lost her husband. So let's look there together. You know, and then down the street. Like, that's the vision for, for doing life in that way. We're, we're letting love guide the way because we're being guided by Jesus, and he's aware of all of it. He knows all the secrets and things we don't know, what's going on in our neighborhood, all the hurts and the pains and the hopes aspirations. And so as we lean into him and fix our eyes on him, that, that love will guide the way for all of us. So that's our hope, my hope for us this week, that we'll grow in that. All of us will grow in that. Even if it's just a little thing to be intentional about that, be mindful and thoughtful about that. So, all right, next week, um, we're going to do uh, the second part of this series. I think it's going to be equally as challenging for all of us and hopeful for all of us. And ladies, don't forget today, if you can, Sign up for the getaway event. It's going to be great September 18th. God bless. Have a nice day.